Welcome to Road TV. My name is Matt Reese. I'm the owner of Road to California and your host for today. We are interviewing Annie Smith, who is a faculty member for both Road at Home and our Road to California in-person show coming up in January 2022. Her Road at Home classes are WL08, Help My Fabric Stash is Growing and I Can't Make It Stop, TL09, or a Philosophy, Thread Matters, uh, F136, If Our Quilts Could Talk, What Would They Say About Us, and S126, Understanding the Value of Color. If you want to take an in-person class with Annie, she's teaching classes starting on Wednesday through Sunday for Road to California 2022, and we'll list those after we're done with the interview. Annie, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Matt. It's so much fun to talk to you. I'm really looking forward to this. Oh, yeah. I, I, I try to have a good time with these. So let's jump right in. How did you get started with quilting? Well, oddly enough, Matt, I came at it as a garment sewer. <laughs> I learned how to sew when I was in junior high. And so in high school, I made all of my own clothes, except for Levi's, because nobody can, you know, improve upon perfection, right? And, um, but I would make something over the weekend, wear it to school, and then my friends would say, oh, I want you to make that for me. Will you sew for me? And so I started making clothes for my friends during the week, and then I, you know, make a new outfit, wear it to school, and I'd have more orders. And then uh, my senior year, their moms started coming to me. And so my senior year through college, I had a cottage industry making clothes for my friend's mothers. <laughs> and so that's how I put myself through school. And then um, in 1980, I got married. And when I found out I was pregnant, I thought, wow, great, I'm going to make a quilt because I had never made one before. I grew up in a house where um, my mom and my grandmother wanted to be modern. And so we used bedspreads, you know, that was the trend during that time. And um, so I didn't really know what a quilt was. And I found a book called um, Let's Make a Patchwork Quilt that taught you how to make quilt blocks completely by hand, you know, with tracing around uh, cardboard cereal box templates with a pencil and cutting out the quarter inch seam allowance with an eight inch uh, pair of shears. You know, there was no such thing as a rotary cutter when I started. And so I, my first quote was completely made by hand, um, uh, sewn with a needle and thread, quilted by hand, everything. And so that's how I started. And then um, once I had one baby, 17 months later, I had another one, which was like, Ugh! and I needed a way to get out and do something that would help me not feel like I was drowning in children. And so my husband suggested taking a quilting class. And I took one class on a Wednesday night for three hours. And I came home and I said, I need to do this every week. <laughs> So I just started taking class after class after class. And it was wonderful. You know, it helped me feel like I still had my own identity while, you know, having my sweet kids. And, and then um, it turned into a full-time job after the dot-com bust. And because I had worked in Silicon Valley for 20 years, building call centers and teaching customer service excellence uh, classes. And my job went over to India and because all the call centers went over to India. <laughs> and so there was no job for me. And so I just thought, well, you know, I, I had started teaching in 1984. And so even though I worked full time, I still would teach a class one night a week and kept my hand in that. And um, so I just thought, well, you know, I could hang a quilt in a quilt shop and, you know, after a month, I'd have eight students and that's a full class. And so I started teaching this class that was a 12 week class. It was a sampler of techniques that taught you everything you needed to know for how to make a quilt from beginning to end. And so you know, I'd have a class full of students and then they'd tell their friends and then they'd be the next class and then they'd come back maybe and take a class with a new friend. And, and so it just was like a snowball rolling downhill. And then when 9-11 started, uh, happened, all of a sudden people 
realized that they hadn't done what they really wanted to do, something that was on their bucket list. And quilting just happened to be one of those things. And so I went from teaching one night a week to five days a week, and it was a full-time job, you know, 40 hours a week. So, and that's how I got into designing my own patterns, becoming an author, and all of the things that have happened wonderfully for me since then. So when did you start traveling to teach? In 2006, um, I attended my first quilt market. And from there, I was invited to go and teach and lecture and uh, all that. So, and before COVID and the country shut down, I was teaching probably six months out of the year and away from home and to travel. So it, it's a little bit different for me to be home. <laughs> well, you must have great frequent flyer miles. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I miss it. You know, I really do miss it. But doing the virtual classes is really nice too. So you are a Bernina artist and an Orophil. I don't know what Orophil calls their... Uh... <laughs> I'm an aura philosopher okay. and we're the ones who um, are certified to teach about aura philosophy thread, which is where my lecture comes from. So aura philosophy thread matters is all about aura thread, all of the different weights and how thread is processed and manufactured and things like that. And well, you through quite the training for that, didn't you? Uh, yeah, pretty much. You know, although I've been using Orofil thread ever since I very first saw it in any quilt shop, and that was before um, they actually went to their first quilt market. <laughs> so I'm I'm a real fan. <laughs> and a Bernina artist. Um, yeah, I'm I'm an artisan ambassador, and which means that I love Bernina. I use it pretty much exclusively, um, and uh, I go to stores that sell Berninas and do a lecture and, and uh, talk about the things that I love about Bernina and the accessories and things. So I'm not a Bernina instructor. I just am an ambassador for them. And it is my favorite machine. That's the first sewing machine I bought when I started teaching in 1984. It's the gateway machine. <laughs> <laughs> I now have five. <laughs> <laughs> Including a searcher. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we, we talked a little bit about the journey that led you to where you are today. Um, but what are the kind of transitions you went through from that first hand piece to quilt? Did you kind of dabble a little bit in art or were you always kind of um, in the direction you were headed? No, as a matter of fact. So, you know, the, the first traditional quilting is piecing right? You learn how to piece tra traditional blocks. And so those were the first classes that I took. But then I started getting into art quilts. And uh, I took a story quilt class from Mary Mashuda, who was like the first story quilts lady. Um, I love applique, but I was really intimidated by it. And try as I might, I could never do needle turn applique. And then I took a class from Sue Nichols um, for a week at one of the empty spool seminars. And that is the just a great way to immerse yourself in the technique that you're trying to learn. And so I learned how to do machine applique. And so machine applique has become one of my areas of expertise because of that, because I just, I loved it so much. And it was the technique of it was just so natural. And so I caught on pretty quickly. And so the two books that I've done for CNT Publishing are on machine applique. <laughs> so what, other than a machine, what are your favorite tools for machine applique? Oh, well, they, there are a couple things, you know, like maybe about five things that are really, um, important for machine applique. One is a really fantastic fusible web. And so um, I use soft fuse, the one that Stacy Michelle uh, is the distributor for in the United States. I think it really is the best product on the market. And that's what I use for my quilts. Because when I make my applique quilts, I want them to be 
museum quality. You know, I mean, uh, they're not uh, craft quilts necessarily. I want them to be fine art basically. And so that's why I use that. And then um, a really great pair of scissors and um, thread, of course, which I use Aurafil 28 weight thread, which is thicker than the 50 weight thread. And it comes in all the same colors. Um, a fantastic sewing machine. <laughs> so the Bernina that has the perfect blanket stitch. And um, I'm trying to think of what else I use. That is, those are pretty much the basic things for machine applique. So shifting gears, since we were all locked down in March, what have you been up to? Uh, well, I was, I was in North Carolina when the, um, when the country shut down. And so I had to find a way home and decided to fly. And there were 12 people on my flight. <laughs> And so I came home to all of a sudden, all of my gigs being uh, rescheduled to 2021. And so I, I haven't had very many gigs, but um, I've had to um, evolve uh, my teaching to video virtual, you know, via Zoom. But the great part about that is, is that that's my background. <laughs> I worked in Silicon Valley. I know my way around computers. I, um, before Craftsy ever started, I produced my own online classes and they were global. And so, you know, I had all the equipment. I didn't have to buy anything. I just needed to figure out how to set everything up in the new space that I'm working on in Texas, because my space here is so much smaller than the space that I had in California. And so, excuse me, it was a real adjustment for that. Um, but so I've been working on some UFOs that I never <laughs> have a chance to work on. Um, and, you know, I've kind of been working on things like that where, wow, I have the luxury to work on this. But the one thing that I've really been doing is um, organizing my workspace. And specifically, there's a, there's a new app out called Cora, which is C-O-R-A. And it allows you to take a picture of fabric, um, designate where it's kept, uh, what colors are in it, what the manufacturer is, uh, what the size of the yardage is, where you bought it. If there's a link out to the internet, you can put it in there, but you can keep track of your fabric. And of course, I didn't want to start there because <laughs> that would have been really ugly. So I started with all my garment making fabric of which I have, you know, they're, they're much larger yardage pieces. And um, so I cataloged every piece of garment fabric that I own in my Cora app so that if I go shopping, I don't duplicate what I already own because it's on my phone. Um, or if I need more yardage of a particular fabric, all I have to do is pull it up and I know exactly what it is that I need. And so I did that, but then I also organized all of my dressmaking patterns in uh, using comic book boards and bags and boxes. And so those are also all cataloged. And it took me about a week, you know, full time <laughs> to do that entire project. But I loved it because I've also been sewing clothes for myself during this time. And actually, I'm working on a quilt, a mystery quilt along for 2021. It'll start in April with my good friend, Cherry Guidry, who is um, a machine embroidery and machine applique person. Our um, styles blend together really well. And so that's going to be coming about. We'll start announcing it in January. So that's the other project that I'm working on. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. It is. It is. And, you know, it, it's good to, to keep busy, you know, because the, the being enclosed all the time <laughs> kind of gets to you after a while. But I also have um, five grandchildren who live nearby 
two of them are two years old. Oh my. <laughs> they're not twins, but they're, they're cousins. And it is just so much fun. So once we got through all of the um, quarantine period, you know, and, you know, from time to time, you know, we quarantine off for a couple of weeks to make sure we're not going to spread anything, but um, then they can come over to play. And, and so it's great. There's nothing like little kids. <laughs> I love little kids. <laughs> I know little kids. <laughs> yes, I know you do. <laughs> and it's so different, Matt, to be a grandparent than a parent. I bet it is. See, I get them given back all wired up and full of sugar or, oh, here, change a diaper. I it know, right? Be on the here giving away end than the receiving <laughs> end. <laughs> Anything goes at Granny's house. <laughs> right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Well, sure. let's talk a little bit about your road at home classes. Yes. Um, you're teaching a lecture on Wednesday, help my fabric stash is growing and I can't make it stop. Yes. Okay. So that came about when, you know, when we buy fabric for a quilt and we're going to work on one project, we have this big pile of fabric and we cut it all up and we make the quilt and the quilt tops done. And then we go to refold all the fabric that's left over and it is still this big <laughs> because we might've added to it while we were making the project, but we don't use as much fabric as we think we're gonna use. So we've always got leftover. And I just thought, you know what? What am I gonna do with this? If I, if I assimilate it into my stash, I'm just gonna feel guilty when I go to buy more fabric and I don't do guilty. <laughs> so I just thought, you know what? I am going to make another quilt using this fabric. I'll add fresh background fabric. And when I was done with that one, I, I made a little lap quilt. And then um, I refolded the fabric. And I still had this much fabric. And I just thought, OK, there's something going on here. So I made another quilt. And this one ended up being a queen size quilt, bigger than the original quilt. And but all I did was add a, a fresh background fabric of a different color. And so I finished with all of that stash and I was pretty happy about it. So that's where the idea about help my fabric stash is growing and I can't make it stop came from. So I share photos of fabric stashes. Fabric stashes of people who are famous and people who are not famous and nobody knows who they are because I had to promise when I received the pictures that I wouldn't reveal who they were. And then uh, I offer a lot of really cool ideas for um, organization. You know, I mean, you can see that my, my uh, shelves are behind me. I rely a lot upon Ikea. I love Ikea for organizational things because it's affordable and it's not fine furniture, but you know, for, um, for our craft stuff, we don't need to use fine furniture, right? Just what's available. And frankly, I'd rather spend more money on fabric and, and uh, going to cool quilt shows and stuff like that than putting it into a room that's just gonna sit there. So that's where that came from. So I, I offer a lot of really cool tips on, um, you know, different things that people have done to organize their stashes and, and put their rooms together. Sounds like something every quilter should watch. It's it's fun because it it ends up being really funny, <laughs> you know, because we all have this little secret and it's our stash and we don't want anybody to know about it. And we all agree and we can all, you know, we just know that we all understand each other. <laughs> <laughs> so shifting gears to Thursday, TL09 or a philosophy thread matters. That's another lecture. Yes. Yes. And so that is all of the background behind Orofil threads, how they started, um, which was not uh, for the quilting industry. It was for another industry, um, how their thread is made. And it is mind blowing to know how thread is made because, you know, we, we think a lot about our fabric and, and, um, we don't realize that we really use as much thread as we use fabric and it's important to know how it's made and and what our options are because who knew 
that there could be seven different thread weights and Orophil carries seven different thread weights. And uh, the lecture also shows what um, the Aura philosophers do with it so that when you see the lecture, you can understand how you can use it too. So it's really cool. Wonderful. And Friday is F136. If our quilts could talk, what would they say about us? Matt, what is that lecture about? <laughs> Let me tell you. Okay. So when I started quilting, Barbara Brackman and, you know, the heavy, the heavy hitters in the industry all told, you know, just, it was so important to put a label on your quilt because the museums have um, acquired quilts and they have no idea who made them. No idea what the background of the quilter was because all the quilts were being made as utility quilts, but they have turned into art, you know, like the one, the Amish quilts and, and, uh, you know, the collections that people have that are really significant. And so we all understood that it was really, really important to let people know where we were from, what our name was, the year that we made it, so that it could be aged and identified properly in the future. And even if you make a, a twin size quilt for your niece who's going off to college, it should still have a label on it because uh, it's also a way to connect with the person who you're giving the quilt to, right? You know, made with love for you, right? So, but here's the deal. Um, there were several little short articles in Quilter's Home Newsletter that talked about the background of the women who made the quilts. And it was only because they kept personal journals and wrote about quilting in their journals, which not very many women did. So the, the idea behind my class is that I, I realized at one point after looking at one of those stories, I looked up on the wall at one of my quilts because I hang quilts on my wall as art in my home. And I started thinking about, it was about 10 years old maybe, and I started thinking about all this history that is inside that quilt, where I bought the fabric, the person who I went with, you know, for a little let's go fabric buying and have lunch thing, um, who is now gone. Um, my kids when they were little, fun things that they did, you know, one of them has a piece of fabric from the dress that I made for my daughter for her first day of school ever in it, you know, and so it has all this history, the things that were going on in the world at that time that I was making that quilt, in the town where I lived, in my community, in my home, but specifically in my heart, and they are secret stories that only we know that if we don't write those stories down and make them a part of that quilt, then when we pass, those stories are going with us. And it's a very personal history of our own that we have the opportunity to tell and we just don't realize what a gold mine we have for our kids and our grandkids who, you know, my mom died in 2005 and I am the the keeper of all of the photos and letters and cards and stuff. And she and my dad went to the same high school. So I have their high school yearbooks. And I sat down maybe about six months after she died and I was going through the yearbook and I was reading all these inscriptions that their friends wrote, you know, the inscriptions that people write in high school <laughs> yearbooks. And I'm going, oh my gosh, did somebody really say that about my dad? And my dad died uh, in 1975. So there, there's that part that my mom could have answered for me, but my dad couldn't. And so all of this personal stuff about who were my parents as teenagers, right? That we have no idea because they didn't leave a journal or anything behind but our quilts are beautiful opportunities for storytelling for us and that's what that class is all about and that that's why it's important and and I actually do teach that um, it's one of the um, 
selections in my brochure for teaching at guilds and stuff. And so it's brand new. I will teach it for road for the very first time, but it's got great information that quilters need to think about because quilters are thinking about it. We're talking about it on social media. And so I know that, that it's in people's minds. They just don't know how to go about it. Sounds like a great uh, place to get some ideas on how to, how to, how to record all that information that, you know, as a younger generation that, that we could already tell we're, we're lacking from our, from, you know, the older generations, things are, we've gotten passed down to us and so on. Right. Right. Well, yeah, because, you know, the, wouldn't you love to know what the story behind a particular quilt is in the life of the quilter who made it? Right. Really special. All right. Last one. S126, understanding the value of color. Oh, yeah. OK, so that one came about. I have been teaching that concept for probably about 25 years, and I understood or got the idea about it from my students who would come in with fabric to make a quilt and they had no idea what they were choosing because choosing fabric can be confusing, right? And because we're given a collection of fabric and we're being told here, use this collection to make this quilt and it will be beautiful. But if there's not enough contrast between the different fabrics, um, even though there are color changes between, you know, they're like maybe in a, a collection of 18 fabrics, there might be three colorways, so orange, green, and yellow. Um, but sometimes even though there's a color change, it doesn't make any difference. You have to have contrast. You have to understand how to read your fabric. And, you know, I mean, if you look at, you know, my fabric stash behind me, um, you know, it, it's just, this, uh, sorry, this one right here, this is all multicolored prints and they just all kind of blend into each other. And that's what we're given to make quilts with. And so you have to, you know, th this class is all about understanding how to look at your fabric, read your fabric. We talk about fabric trends, what the manufacturers give us, um, what the little color bubbles mean on the edge of a selvage, which most people don't know about, uh, which is a secret. <laughs> and um, then we play with fabric and we cut it up into little shapes and um, use a glue stick and paste the fabric on a sheet of paper that has a block design on it, and then put that on a page sleeve and create a resource binder for ourselves. And so it's, it's all about uh, you know, learning how to choose and then making your own choices to remind yourself when you make go to choose fabric in the future, this is how you need to do it. And it's, it's, it's different than every other color class that everybody's teaching. It has nothing to do with color theory. It has everything to do with choosing fabric. Because that's our biggest problem. You know, it just in the last couple of years, other people have started teaching classes on how to choose fabric, and a couple of people have written books on it. But before that, there was no such thing. <laughs> so it's it's still a new concept for a lot of people. Well, I think it was something that they would rely on the local quilt shop to help them with. They'd show up and they'd say, I need help with this. And now, now with the local quilt shops not as prevalent as they once were, Right. Uh, we'll have to find another resource. That's true. And, you know, I agree with you. They did rely upon the people who worked in the quilt shop. And not all people who worked in quilt shops understood how to choose fabric either. And then we'd come home and go, oh, my gosh, that's not at all what I wanted. And then we'd go to another store and buy a whole new set of fabric because we didn't want to go back to the original store for fear of offending somebody. We've all done it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just a part of quilting, you know, but, but we do agonize over our fabric choices all the way out to what binding is correct to put on our quilt. And I mean, I even have examples of a quilt that I was doing that I was sure I was going to use this fabric that I bought at the very beginning 
to be my borders. I even sewed it on and I put it up on the design wall, took the picture and went, oh, that is so wrong. And so at two o'clock in the morning, I was picking out uh, the borders all the way off and then put the right border on that was supposed to be on it. And so, you know, it, it, there are a lot of little personal experience uh, experiences that I teach uh, as a part of the class. And so I have real quilts that I use as, as uh, you know, the curriculum for my class. So they know what it is that I'm talking about. Perfect. Okay, so to sum it up, Annie is teaching for Road at Home. She's teaching classes WL08, Help My Fabric Stash is Growing and I Can't Make It Stop, TL09, or a philosophy, Thread Matters. F136, if our quilts could talk, what would they say about us? And S126, understanding the value of color. For our in-person event in January of 2022, she's offering class 3014C, Build Your Color Sense. 4015C, the 110 quilt. 5014C, or a fill Thread Matters. 6014C, the A word by machine. 7012C, A is for applicate. Registration for the Road at Home classes is available right now. And registration for the in-person event will resume in July of 2021. Annie, what is your website? My website is www.anniesmith.net. And so it's A-N-N-I-E. And it's just that simple. <laughs> and you can register at www.road2ca.com. Annie, thank you so much for joining me today. I had a great time. Thank you so much, Matt. <laughs> great. Everyone take care and be safe. And we'll see you next time on Road TV.